So in this lecture two, I I don't know whether I will be able to cover this already. Okay, let us see. We have a long way to go. <clears throat> this is the second part of the introduction to radio astronomy. Okay. Then uh, from the uh, last uh, part of the story that we explained some coordinates and uh, uh, we talked about uh, the especially the UVW coordinates and LM coordinates. So here uh, uh, we can see that how it is related with a single uh, dish. JMRT is a complicated uh, um, uh, is a more complicated system than a single dish system because there are many antennas but to simplify things first I will talk about uh, how you can uh, do radio astronomy using a uh, single antenna yeah so so I just uh, start reading from here and then I will start explaining so here it says, assume a single dish uh, telescope, its aperture is at the origin of UVW coordinates and W points to the source. In the last lecture I said that W is the coordinate of the UVW um, coordinate system which always points towards the source and the beam of the antenna will be along uh, the W axis. So here you can see, if we take a single dish, you can see that uh, it has some cross-sectional area. That is um, pi um, uh, g square by 4 or something, I, I don't uh, remember it, but there is definitely a proportional to the um, radius square, that is the area. Pi r square, I think that, that is what uh, it, it is. So that is the aperture, uh, that is the physical aperture area of the antenna. And the antenna um, receives with some uh, uh, some energy it receives, which is which comes in this area. It receives that energy, and uh, that energy um, is always uh, less than that would have been actually if you collect the energy over this entire area. And that's because of uh, antenna efficiency and so on. So those things I will talk about uh, in, uh, various things about antennas in probably in the next few lectures we will be talking about them. But here for simplicity assume that um, this 100% efficient antenna, you have a distant radio source and you have parallel rays coming here because it's much far away and it is reaching the aperture plane of the dish antenna. Now in this aperture plane we can place this UVW coordinates. See here you can see this is the aperture plane of the antenna and the beam pattern of the dish is this one and on the sky you can see the source this source um, intensity will be distributed like this so uh, as I said that this is uh, LM N coordinates the N is directed uh, along this line same as W um, and L square plus M square plus N square is equal to unity that is how they calculate it so um, yeah, here these are explanatory, self-explanatory. So this is the distributed object field. Uh, this about this uh, radio distribution, and this is the antenna pattern, and this is the uh, great sphere. Great sphere means great circle, as I said last time about the astronomical coordinates. Uh, this is the sphere, and this is the distributed aperture field. This field in this area that will be um, caused by the rays that are coming here. So that is, uh, and uh, the, there will be distribution of electric field, changing uh, changing electric field and magnetic field may be there. And this is the aperture uh, plane. If you keep this diagram in mind, maybe in the next few slides when we go for the uh, several things uh, that will come out from here, you will see. Now I will just read this one. On the sky led to, uh, since I, uh, I may miss something, so I will read it. On the sky, let the two-dimensional electric field distribution be centered on uh, Lm. So this is the uh, distributed electric field that is a function of uh, Lm in the sky, Lm coordinates. On the UV plane, the electric field distribution uh, EUV. So here the distribution on this one is 
uh, electric field E uh, function of uh, U and V in two, these two directions. In W we are not considering it. Is a result of the electric field uh, distribution VLM on the sky. The, because of this E U V occurring here is due to uh, VLM occurring there. And W U V is the autocorrelation of the electric field points on the UV plane. So along this dish, the, we can divide the uh, dish sub, uh, aperture into several small, small uh, points, and uh, you can calculate the autocorrelations at those points. And that distribution is this W U V. <coughs> now, uh, you can map it. Uh, the mapping says that a two-dimensional Fourier transform of uh, this autocorrelation function WUV is the intensity field distribution ILM of the source in the LM space. You will see in more details just this for uh, remembering, but do remember this diagram. This diagram will, it will come again and again in case of arrays and many other places it will come maybe in next few lectures also it will come. Now this is another concept which uh, people should uh, be knowing. In, 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 in communications, people um, use um, this uh, formula that KT delta nu or KT B, B is the bandwidth. Um, but uh, as engineers, they may be applying it, but they um, may not be remembering how they were derived. So here we come to this derivation. <coughs> we consider a, um, uh, consider a resistor R at temperature T. And if delta nu is the bandwidth in hertz, then the power available at the terminal of the resistor is, is the, this W is equal to KT delta nu, where K is the Boltzmann constant. And delta nu is the bandwidth in hertz, and T is in Kelvin. So then W will be in watts, that is joules, uh, 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 joules per second. Boltzmann constant is given in joules per Kelvin. Okay, so this formula everybody knows that um, KT delta nu or KTB, this formula everybody knows that T is a temperature, K is a Boltzmann constant, nothing complicated here for the resistance R at a temperature T. Now, let us take a, um, okay, the spectral power W per unit bandwidth is in what? per hertz is W is equal to KT. Okay. So, if you remove it, divide this by this delta nu. So, what you will be left out is, is, um, is what per, um, per hertz. And why we do this? Um, in the last slide, again I, um, uh, at the end of the lecture uh, one, uh, two, I again I forgot to show you that one. This is, uh, See, um, when you me measure power over small bandwidth, sometimes the power may be uh, constant. For example, if you if you measure the noise uh, you over a small bandwidth, you can consider the average uh, distribution of noise over the bandwidth is constant. But from Planck's law and other um, laws, you can see that the intensity may change with frequency. So this uh, change of intensity, uh, different frequency uh, has to make us uh, some something to be frequency dependent. So you can see the prism um, when it uh, actually it, uh, spreads the white light into several colors. You can see the uh, distribution of the colors over the over the uh, different uh, I mean each of these colors are of uh, different frequencies and their power may not be same so therefore we need some characterization of the power for uh, some particular frequency and for some bandwidth so that is why this bandwidth is coming in whereas for communication applications we have very Narrowband signals or signals which are constant, uh, 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 which are uh, functions of sines and cosines, where you consider the 
bandwidth of the signal or the, the de dealing is different. But in astronomy, astronomy we are dealing with uh, noise kind of thing because the, the signals that come from astronomical objects are like noise and they are spread out over the entire uh, bandwidth and the, there is a distribution also of this uh, noise that they do not remain same for in, uh, over the entire bandwidth, they may vary. So, if you, uh, now we come to this definition, uh, definition, the spectral power W per unit bandwidth is in watts per third is W is equal to KT. Uh, let us uh, take a uh, lossless uh, matched isotropic antenna having a uh, radiation resistance RR R equal to R. Now what is an isotropic antenna? Uh, it is a theoretical analogy of an antenna that radiates equally in all directions. That is something, some power divided by 4 pi R square, the law of, uh, the inverse square law of radiation, uh, it follows. So that is a isotropic antenna, but it doesn't exist practically, it is only a theoretical concept. Now let us take a lossless match isotopic antenna having a radiation resistance RR. Now again I have to do the explanation for the radiation resistance. If the uh, antenna is perfect, I mean there is no loss or anything like that, then um, you can consider the um, whatever radiation falls into the antenna, it will make a power exactly, uh, um, it will derive the full power into uh, into a load resistance from there. Now, <coughs> that um, load resistance, um, if you, um, for maximum power transfer theorem, if you connect another, uh, the, the output of the uh, antenna to a load resistance, that load resistance should be able to ab uh, absorb the entire power. I will come to these definitions uh, in, in more details in uh, later slides, but just, just for this, you can remember that that particular resistance which absorbs the full power from the antenna for the time being, you can uh, remember this, that is called the radiation resistance of the antenna for now. It's not that, you will know it in more details, but for now you can think that way. So the power at the, at its terminals will be, so now that you have taken a lossless matched antenna having a radiation resistance RR, so you want to calculate the power on this one. It will be zero if the antenna doesn't receive any radiation and greater than zero if the radiation is received. Okay. Now, if we place this antenna inside a black body, so here is a black body, you can see this is a uh, black body, and you are placing this antenna inside. This black body is heated at temperature T so that it will cause it to radiate. So some the internal radiations will be received by this antenna. So we want to see what is the power that is available at the antenna terminals. If we put the antenna inside a black body which is kept at temperature T. So um, if we place the antenna inside the black body at temperature T so that it collects only the radiation and converts the spectral power WA, we find that this WA is equal to W or KTA is equal to KT. That is the antenna temperature is equal to the temperature of the black body. So this relation shows that if you place an antenna inside a black body and the antenna is subjected to receive all the radiations uh, from this, then if you calculate this temperature T relating uh, with this uh, expression of a resistance, the resistance of, uh, is the re re radiation resistance of the antenna. From there, if you relate it, then you will find that the temperature it receives is the same as that of the black body. So, um, this is very important. We should develop the concepts of antenna temperature and then only you can go for um, further more discussions. I don't know, people may be having some doubt in this one, but uh, you have any doubt right now? This is a very basic concept. Okay. So now we uh, take a case that uh, 
we have shown in the last uh, diagram that that is this one. We showed that um, uh, that the internal temperature should be equal to the temperature of the black body. Now, instead of the black body, if you consider this, uh, uh, remove this black body and you place the antenna under uh, the sky. Assume that the sky is also radiating and it receives the radiation. This antenna receives the radiation from the sky. Then the equivalent temperature of the antenna will be equal to that of the sky. Of course, that is not the um, physical temperature. A cold body can be made to radiate more electromagnetic radiation. This temperature is the sense of the electromagnetic power and subjected to the Planck's law where you get the temperature. So this, this temperature is related by Planck's law. We receive in radio and we follow the Planck's curve and we go to that uh, top and we find what is the temperature and so on. That, that is how it is actually related. So this is a comparison. So um, we developed this um, concept of uh, antenna temperature from a black body and then we are applying it under the open sky. So this gives you the uh, sky temperature. The antenna temperature should be equal to the sky temperature. So I will read this one. An isotopic antenna enclosed inside a black body enclosure at temperature T. The antenna temperature Ta is equal to the black body temperature T. Sky temperature um, T sky is picked by an antenna since its radiation pattern is pointing towards it. Well, the, there, there is something which I missed out. The radiation pattern, the entire radiation pattern, including slide lobes and other things, should be directed along the sky. If you don't uh, do that one, then that uh, it has to be multiplied with the how much uh, pattern was not available and how much pattern was available, that ratio. So we assume that we don't have any side lobe or back lobe of the antenna and only it directs in this direction. So the entire power it collects is from the sky. In, in that case only we have this one. That is the antenna temperature is equal to sky temperature. Now we go to the um, some of the principles of receiving uh, receivers or the radio telescope, very um, primitive kind of thing which I am showing you here, but this is um, the basic structure of a radio telescope based on communication uh, receivers. They are they were actually built by communication engineers only. I mean that, that, that's why they look like that. So you have this uh, antenna here and you have a low noise amplifier and a band pass filter <laughs> and then you mix it down to form an intermediate frequency using this local uh, local oscillator so that intermediate frequency uh, remains constant and this uh, later part of it you don't have to change the frequency of that one that is why the intermediate frequency is uh, uh, made otherwise there is no point in making intermediate frequency and this entire information is in the intermediate frequency now and then we have a detector and an integrator. This detector is simply a diode detector followed by a capacitor and a resistor. This RC determines that um, the slope of the integrator and also the time of integration uh, you can find out from this. And this uh, integration will give you, uh, help you to detect the uh, power in the uh, signal that you are uh, feeding it at the detector. This will detect the power of the detector uh, signals. And that, um, um, that, that proportionality is, uh, we want to know the, what is the power, we are measuring the power here. And that is slightly amplified uh, for our convenience to drive uh, some instrument. So this is a DC amplifier here. And then um, modern computers uh, use uh, uh, digital um, systems, so you have to convert this analog into digital and then feed it to a computer, whereas the computer can analyze the data or just display it on the screen with uh, how the power is uh, coming here. The power versus the time, if you change the direction of the antenna, you will see that all these things uh, you can see on the screen are changing. This local oscillator can take you to different frequencies, assuming this uh, low noise amplifier is a very wide bandwidth. You can, it can allow you to go to different um, frequencies, uh, frequency bands. The, the text says, a basic heterodyne radio, receiver, radio telescope receiver. The antenna, low noise amplifier, um, uh, low noise RF amplifier, mixer, local oscillator, IF amplifier detector, DC amplifier, 
and data recording computer as well. Of course, the computer also records the data. Now, um, this is the um, uh, single dish uh, radio telescope, uh, which is the world's largest uh, steerable uh, single dish uh, radio telescope. Um, named after the Green Bank uh, Telescope GBT, located in NRL. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to climb on this one, and this is really huge. This is a hundred meters uh, diameter. Uh, this this one, uh, you can see the vehicles around here. It's uh, really huge, huge antenna, and it is fitted on a rail which uh, which allows it to rotate. So this is the uh, this is a steerable um, telescope. Whereas there are telescopes uh, of single dish type, much bigger than this, like Arecibo, they are not steerable. Only the feet can be moved. Now, from this telescope, you, uh, this is the this is one of the images that has been created from the telescope. This is uh, I will just read it out. A, an image of Cygnus X uh, region. This is another astronomical object at 790 megahertz in equatorial coordinates. So you will see equatorial coordinates as I explained last time. This is right ascension and this is declination. It was made during the commissioning of GBT, the Green Back Telescope. Uh, I mean, new, new GBT. There was a old GBT, I know that, but it just collapsed after working for several years and they made the replacement for that with that new telescope. Uh, still it is called GBT. The beam width is approximately 16 arc minutes. So from this, um, and I don't know whether people um, may be having question about what is a uh, what is a beam width. Beam width you can uh, consider it uh, in roughly you can say what is the. There are several definitions: half power beam width, the beam width between first nulls, and and so on. So this is actually this is the beam width between first nulls. So um, this is about 16 hours minutes. So you can imagine that. And also, uh, I will tell you that if you make larger and larger uh, sized antennas, then uh, your beam width becomes narrower. Similarly, if you increase the frequency of the um, observation, then also the beam width becomes uh, narrower. And you want to resolve the sources um, of, of astronomical sources. If you want to get finer details of those things, so you have to use narrow beam. So even the 16 hour minute, that is a very small number if you see, but still it is not suitable uh, for uh, astronomical observations, which radio astronomers expect and do uh, now. So they use arrays. So the arrays have got many advantages as well as disadvantages also. The single dishes are a very simple uh, set of uh, things. And also um, nowadays, uh, when I go to the imaging techniques, uh, if uh, if I get time at that time, I will tell you that single dishes are also to be included in uh, radio arrays for getting the um, lower frequency component in imaging and mapping. <coughs> okay, um, the signals from Cygnus A are completely saturated. So these lines, uh, these places shows that it's completely saturated. That means. It is overdriving the mm, radio telescope, so it is not in the uh, it, it, its receiver might have got saturated. <coughs> this is from NRO. Okay, now we go to the receiving principles. Some um, basic techniques, um, these uh, formulas uh, you may be knowing or. Uh, uh, yet to know uh, the for uh, improving the signal to noise ratio. Uh, I'll just uh, start from reading here uh, since I don't want to miss anything. Consider two signals consisting of common uh, signals and different noise signals as uh, uh, functions of time. It means that you have two signals in which you consider the signals to be common and the noise are uh, different. That is what happens when you receive the same signal using two different receivers. Since the receivers are independent, they will generate their own noise, and uh, whereas the signals are coming from same source, so the signal part will be common to both of them. 
So if the signals are multiplied, the common signal boosts up, whereas the noise part diminishes. If you multiply those two signals, you will see that the things which are common, they will, which are same alike, they will get amplified, whereas the uh, dislike things will get. I mean, that's because of there will be a phase difference between that. If they are opposite, 180 degrees or so, they will cancel up totally. Otherwise, some CD will be left out. So, if we if an integration is performed over time, the signal to noise ratio further improves. Last time we saw that uh, in radio receiver, we do integrate in the detector. So, it says that you say you can further improve it by integration. Now, there are um, two things that come out of it. One is called the cross correlation. Another is called the auto correlation. The uh, the cross correlation is usually represented by small r as a function of tau, and auto correlation is usually represented by capital R as a function of tau. Tau is uh, also related to time. It's a dummy variable. We'll come to that. So the cross correlation is mm, between. Um, between two um, signals, FT and GT. The F is one signal as a function of time, and G also is another signal as a function of time. The cross correlation is given by F star. F star means the complex conjugate of uh, F tau uh, integrated over this period of time, uh, GT plus tau. And uh, in digital form, you can actually make this into, you can digitize it. And uh, this m are integers. This n is another integer, and this is same. And this is actually uh, a stream of uh, numbers. Uh, you you can get this same expression in digital form in this way. And autocorrelation is again you have to replace this uh, one of this signal with the other one. Now here uh, f star tau is, remains as it is. Here g t plus tau is replaced by f t plus tau. Remember that this star represents the complex conjugate. And this is the digital expression. OK. Now with all this, what we have been studying so far from the UVW coordinates that right now we started before some time. So this is the final. Um, uh, a summary kind of thing you can say. This is called um, winner Kinchin theorem. I don't know how to spell this one. I never found out. Um, uh, it is also known as some difficult name that winner Kinchin theorem or something like that. So it says that the power spectral density of a white sense stationary random process is the Fourier transform of the corresponding autocorrelation function. So on the dish surface, we found that there will be autocorrelation functions. The fields, you have to uh, go through the autocorrelation, and you have to develop those points um, on the surface of the uh, dish or the surface of uh, UV plane. And then if you want to know the uh, spectral uh, power spectral density of the object that is uh, responsible for this field, that is the astronomical object, then uh, you simply relate that one with this. Where this is the spectral uh, power spectral density uh, of the object responsible for that, and this is the autocorrelation, this capital R, <coughs> and this uh, e to the power. Uh, this uh, this is a Fourier transform <coughs> of the autocorrelation function. So this part is the Fourier transform of uh, this part. This expression is the Fourier transform of this. This is what this theorem says. Now, what do you mean by white sense uh, stationary random process? <coughs> random process, uh, in a random process, as I said, that there will be a bell shaped curve or, uh, you know, of the probability density function as a function of um, the random variable, probability density function yeah. of that random variable along y axis and the random variable along x axis. So from that bell-shaped curve, you can find out what is the mean and the variance. If you remember the figure, uh, I'm trying to remember it. So if it is a um, wide sense stationary random process, if you try to calculate the variance and mean of those uh, of that uh, process after 
a gap of time, you will see that it doesn't change, it remains. Of course, you have to take a data over some period of time, little bit of uh, time, otherwise you can't, cannot uh, calculate the variance and other things and all. But then what, what is meant by that is that the property of the random process does not change, the mean does not change and the variance does not change with time. Okay. Now we go, go to the radio arrays. Now, um, generally, two types of radio arrays are used in radio astronomy. One is called the phased array, another is the correlator array. So each one has got, uh, um, I mean, one has a, one, uh, they are used for two different purposes. And uh, the advantages of having uh, radio arrays, arrays means there will be number of antennas connected together uh, with some uh, analog, uh, some some kind of uh, pattern, and that uh, the the response of that pattern um, uh, is the array pattern or whatever you say. Now the advantages are here are this difficulties in constructing large single dish can be overcome by arrays. Multiple increase in signal to noise ratio as compared to a single dish increases overall directivity and resolution of the telescope. Effect of arc rotation can be can aid to supersynthesis. This part I have not spoken anything right now, but all these things I have explained. That the um, uh, 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 yeah, this I will talk about it after some time. Now, um, as a note, I have given here the geomorphy configures itself as correlator array when observing spectral lines and continuum radio sources. It configures itself as a phased array when observing pulsars. So as I said that um, these this two are for two different applications. <coughs> now mm, I will start with very simple things. <coughs> Synthesizing uh, a, a large aperture using small apertures. So this is the topic. How do you make a large aperture or a large dish or a large antenna using small small antenna? So you will see what are the difficulties and what are the where we get how how to construct that. So this is the basic ideas behind that. Each antenna has an aperture area, as I said, and if you take a, a array of antennas, you should make sure the total aperture area is the aperture area of the simulated antenna. I mean, it comes automatically. A is equal to sigma. If for here there are four uh, antennas simulating this uh, aperture. So um, the aperture, aperture area, simulated aperture area is sigma um, i is equal to 1 to 4. A1, A2, A3 plus A4. This is what it is. But then, does it really work? So this diagram will explain you that. See, you place the antennas very close to each other. They are touching each other. Okay. Now, um, these are the wave fronts of the signals. We consider these lines to be uh, uh, spaced as uh, one wavelength apart. Okay. Uh, between this line and this line. So, the phase at this line is same as phase at the, uh, this line of the incoming signal. Now, we want to catch um, this wave front the, uh, over a certain area. This area is this aperture area A. So if they are parallel to the, uh, this one, then <coughs> you can take the signal and simply add each, each one of them with another. This tau one uh, represents uh, the delay. Uh, delay uh, you can provide or not provide. Uh, if you provide delay, uh, the delay also gets introduced because some cables will be connected and the signal that is received here will come here after some time. That delay also, you can say that is a delay. So, um, uh, here we are, uh, it's for the purpose of introducing delay is to show that the, we, we use um, techniques for introducing delays that we will see later. So, here in this case, we have to keep this delay same, either zero or same. So here you can see that T1, uh, tau1, tau2, tau3, and tau4 are same. Then only the same wave front. If if you, if you are looking at this uh, direction, the same wave front will be looking uh, will come to you. The plane of the array must be parallel to the wave front. 
not suitable for a moving source on the sky. Suppose the source is here, then the wave fronts will be inclined and then uh, you have to adjust this delay. So you will come to that. <coughs> now here you can see the, um, there was a line antenna that we synthesized. Here we synthesized a larger aperture using smaller apertures of a circular antenna. See here you can see this diagram is self-explanatory. Various antennas are there which actually simulates this. The synthesis of a large circular aperture using many circular apertures. Again, the same formula I have used here that sigma AI, where AI is the, uh, is the aperture area of the, one of these. Now, you know that uh, the radio astronom uh, astronomical sources process us from east to west. Mm, at this uh, place, um, I mean, uh, it, it is not um, static on the sky. What I mean to say is that, so what you are doing is uh, you are actually always moving the um, uh, dishes and the, tracking the source. So, uh, in that kind of system, you will get advantage of using this kind of um, system. That is, see, when this, uh, when the source is up, then uh, they are touching each other. As in the uh, here, you can see in the diagram, they are touching each other. These uh, antennas. Okay. But as the source moves away from the zenith, then you will see that the dishes has to be bent, and then the problem comes. The in this figure, the source is somewhere in this direction. In this. So this is the wave front. This particular wave front will hit this antenna only after some time that is uh, proportional to this distance. And again it will hit this antenna after another some time and another some time it will hit it. So what you are going to do, you, you want to uh, get at the same wave front. So what you will do is you will introduce some delay in this and some delay in this and some delay in this with respect to this. So this de delay um, you introduce maximum delay in this, and this is the um, this is zero delay, and this is one delay, two delay, and three delay. So here it is. Uh, tau one is equal to three delta tau, tau two is equal to two delta tau, tau three is equal to delta tau, tau four is equal to zero. Also, you notice that if the source goes towards the right or left, there will be a shadow of this dish or falling on the other dish. This, this particular thing. Can you see this one? This one. These are the shadows. So what will happen, um, because of the shadow, the area of the dish will also reduce. So naturally you have to space them apart. And when you space them apart, then again other problem comes. That we will see. So here I will uh, read this one. The um, effective area of the synthesized antenna decreases as the source moves to the horizon. The delay is also constantly adjusted for a moving source. Now we come to uh, grating phase that is. This is called the grating uh, kind of the array because uh, of the similarity of the uh, pattern with uh, getting lines of a um, getting used for dispersion or something like that in optics. <coughs> so. Um, as I said, to avoid the uh, shadowing of the uh, uh, antennas over another antenna, you have to separate them with a distance. Now, mm, uh, it's okay. Now, uh, here um, you have to add all of this, and uh, uh, this is the amount of uh, uh, delay that you have to uh, give, you have to convert it into time. So uh, you are dividing it by C. C is the speed of light. Okay. So this is the length actually. If you see the distance between two antennas are D and this angle is theta, so uh, this particular length will be D sine theta. And uh, again this is 1D, 2D, so this will be 2D sine theta and 1D, 2D, 3D, so it will be 3D sine theta. So this distance you have to convert it in um, time. 
So you divide it by um, speed of light and you get the time delay to be introduced. So this, this um, should be equal to zero, this one should be equal to delta tau, and this should be equal to two delta tau, and this should be equal to three delta tau. <coughs> Now what happens to the effective pattern of the uh, of the array? So here if you see this um, uh, this particular thing at the background, this light colored uh, thing you can see, this is the beam pattern. You can see that beam pattern is a function of angle and um, uh, the uh, normalized uh, power along the along this direction. So it has been plotted. Instead of a polar plot, I have uh, taken a rectangular plot here. So it looks something funny. So it will be like this, like this, like this. These are the side lobes. This is the major lobe. This is the beam width between first nulls and so on. And at nine, minus 90 degrees, they close each other. Uh, uh, no, no, I, 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 I have not shown the full thing. They actually close out. Mm, okay. So this is the uh, pattern of a single antenna or as a, if you measure the beam pattern of a single antenna you will see this background one but then effectively um, uh, when you combine this what you are going to see if you consider that the beam pattern of these antennas uh, to be not like this one but it is a, a isotropic that is it is flat so it is flat so in that case you will see the pattern of the entire system will be in uh, like this will be like this what you see here but as soon as you have a pattern of this one, not a, not a circular or spherical pattern, then that has, this has to be again modulated by that pattern. So here is the actual pattern that you will see. So you see that the phase array will have a peak along this direction, then another um, side lobe here, another side lobe here, and there are many, many side lobes here. So if you are able to squeeze this one, if you are able to squeeze the beam width of this, then you will try to extend this beam width as much as possible and reduce all other beam, beams, uh, uh, all other lobes. <coughs> Signals are added after phase correction. Okay, uh, normalized pattern. I think I have not missed out anything here. I'll go to the next slide. Now, mm, these are very um, uh, simple understanding of uh, um, correlators. Uh, correlator is uh, just a, a multiplier and an integrator. It is just to uh, generate the coherence uh, function, as I said in my first lecture, um, this uh, C12 and other uh, C12, uh, if you remember that, um, uh, that is the visibility. We are uh, trying to get the visibility. Now these are two signals, V1T and V2T. They are simply multiplied. An integrator is, um, uh, you know, what is integrator? And this is this gives you the um, average uh, multiply uh, multiplication over time. This this, this bracket indicates that um, it has been worked out. The integration has been worked out over a period of time. Now this small r is the cross correlation is a function of uh, tau g, where tau g is the delay. Um, as I said, that there is a delay between one and, uh, and the one, that particular thing, this tau g. So this is the basic correlator unit. Now, um, if you have, um, let us say, four antennas, then how many of these are required? This diagram shows that. So there, there are four antennas, one, two, Three, four. So um, here, this formula is N C two. Uh, um, if you remember that permutation combination formula or something like that, this is expanded here. N A is the number of antennas. So N A minus one uh, by two into N A, and that is equal to the total number of antennas. So here you can see that you can take correlation between this and this, between this and this, between this and this, between this and this and so on, between this and the, uh, and so on. All these combinations are shown here. And um, after this multiplication integration, they are saved in a computer. Signals from each antenna pair are cross-correlated and saved in a computer along with the autocorrelation product. 
auto correlation uh, this is the auto correlation product see it is just um, you feed these two lines with the same signal so you can see that for the same signal you are generating uh, a auto correlation product whereas here this one is not auto correlation this is cross correlation because this input and this input are different Now, um, iterative plot of the fringe pattern formed by the antenna pair in cross correlation. So, this is the dish pattern and this is the cross pattern. So, this is the uh, pattern of the um, uh, coordinator array. And uh, I, I, um, for this, this dotted line is the dish pattern. This is the dish pattern of the single antenna here, with the pattern of that. <coughs> This is an aerial uh, picture um, taken by Google Map of our uh, uh, GMRT. Some central square antennas are shown. Now we come to the uh, introduction to radio frequency inter interference. Actually, uh, this is the uh, subject which I have worked uh, a large amount of time in this one, and I have several um, publications on this. Um, some of my publications are for my PhD also. So um, I have de de done a considerable amount of work in this one, in analyzing and also reducing and, uh, and other things. Uh, but later that group moved uh, to somebody, it was just given um, for uh, some um, uh, personal reasons, uh, they have given it to somebody. Anyway. Uh, who I don't believe it, uh, that they don't look after it uh, in a proper way because they may be lacking, I don't know, knowledge or whatever it is. I, I don't know what, what, it is, what, what it is, or they may not be interested. Okay, so <coughs> some of the figures that you will see are there in my papers, and if you want to find those papers, you can just give my name in Google, you will find them. They are in Progressing Retromagnetics Research, a MIT journal from US. So, uh, this one, uh, signals of radio astronomy are extremely weak. I have, I'll read this one in case I miss something. Um, radio astronomy signals are extremely weak with respect to man-made noise signals. The radio flux received from our nearest star would be a few solar flux unit, SFU, whereas distant uh, radio station uh, may produce millions of SFUs. So that is a comparison that um, you know, sun is our uh, nearest star and it is supposed to give maximum uh, amount of, uh, uh, I mean, we, we, we are supposed to receive uh, the intensity of sun uh, which will be more than any other distant astronomical object. So sun is very close, that is why. Even that power that we receive from the sun can be overcome by man-made radio uh, disturbances which uh, ought to be around several millions uh, of uh, SFU as compared to uh, uh, one SFU. This SFU is generally used for the sun, 10 to the power minus 22 watts per meter square per hertz. Now, <coughs> that is what it says, that uh, power flux density received from distant radio galaxies varies from microjansky to millijansky, and milli, uh, uh, one jansky is equal to 10 to the power minus 26 watts per meter square per hertz. Uh, we have uh, seen that astronomical sources produce a signal like uh, signals like a Gaussian noise, generally in both polarizations over a wide frequency range. A locally generated wide band noise like that from an electrical arc welding may be quite high uh, uh, to uh, obscure the astronomical signal. So you know that uh, people are uh, preventing. Uh, from other people from generating this sort of uh, noises and all, like arc welding, uh, in workshop um, you cannot do welding and other things in, uh, during observational day. A noise or a signal of any kind interfering or obscuring the uh, astronomical signal is termed as radio frequency interference by radio astronomers. This, this RFI is a, is a term which has been given by uh, radio astronomers. Okay. In engineering domain, nobody says uh, what is RFI. Though they do, their definition of RFI is different from uh, the definition of radio astronomers' uh, definition. Quite different are there. <coughs> so, 
So, um, yeah, since we have a meter wave radio telescope here, I will be talking somewhat uh, about them. RFI couples with uh, radio astronomical data through several ways. Um, it mainly couples in the um, antenna itself, and uh, that is, uh, it enters through the side lobes and the mesh leakage and spillover. Um, it may also leak into the system by penetrating the, um, uh, the shielding of cables. If you are not um, shielding the system properly, the cables are not uh, of good quality, then also the RFI can enter into that. Can also be produced from nonlinear operation. If the in, in, if your electronic system goes into nonlinear mode, that's why I say that the definition of radio frequency difference is different uh, if for radio snowballs. See, if you are operating, your system goes to saturation and it generates some extra products, and you may call that one as you know, radio frequency interference, which is not true. It has been generated by your own system. So those things are also called uh, RFI by radio snowballs. So this is technically not correct. And also, um, to avoid human-generated noise, radio telescopes are commissioned at very remote places like this, which makes people very unhappy. Then, uh, as I was talking about, see, uh, this is how the uh, interference gets coupled into a uh, into one of the antennas, let us say. This is about, uh, in VHF and UHF, I'm talking about um, 30 to 300 and 300 to 3000 megahertz. Mm, that is a range, and our range is in that. So here is a um, source which causes disturbances, which uh, introduces uh, interference in this. So you have the feed here. Antenna feed has a pattern like this. You have several uh, side loops and all. So this interference can directly travel and enter into it. It can again hit, hit the ground and uh, go into that one, in, through the side loops. Okay. The, it will not be able to enter the major lobe because it ha the major lobe is in, in the dish. It is focused in the dish. It cannot go outside the dish. Some spillover are there. Uh, through that it can go because the major lobe, uh, some portion of the major lobe are outside the dish. That is called the spillover. So, <coughs> if it has to enter, it has to enter into this, in one of these. Then, in communication, some signal may be, um, some radio station may be much far away. And because of duct topo scatter um, interference, uh, uh, duct topo scatter phenomena, it can come back and hit the ground and again enter into it. So this will be this point point will be very close to uh, this this one. This is one way of uh, uh, coupling. Uh, I mean, getting coupled while observing an astronomical source at the zenith. The interfering signal may enter through the side lobes of the antenna. This is when you are observing a radio source at the zenith. Radio source means astronomical radio source. So antenna is looking towards the zenith. Now you see this one. In this diagram, <coughs> interfering uh, radio signal entering through telescope antenna, yeah, okay, same actually. And this is for a radio source at small angle from zenith. So this is the zenith and you are looking at a slightly different angle. Now, in this case, what will happen? This interference can uh, directly go into this, or it can enter through this your um, spillovers by reflecting through the ground. And also, the duct topo scatter can also uh, go into that. And then here it is uh, in another way it can get coupled is through the dish leakage. Actually, the dish is uh, not opaque. Uh, some portion of the power um, leaks out through the dish, and RFI can take advantage of that, and um, uh, this, uh, this external signals can take advantage of that and cause uh, radio frequency interference in your system by um, uh, by entering it through the uh, through this uh, mesh or um, uh, through a reflection from the ground. And the duct topo scatter in this case, if it is much uh, in a uh, much ang uh, in an angular direction from the zenith. In that, the duct topo scatter interference can directly hit uh, through the side lobes of your uh, system, uh, of, the, of your feed, antenna feed. So you see how complicated it is to um, design a, a, a radio telescope. You have to think of many, many things in this. You have to think about the communications, um, uh, how you are going to uh, prevent all these 
unwanted things from happening. You have to do a lot of uh, thinking before commissioning and designing uh, your telescope. And also uh, you use Cassegrain or Gagarian or uh, offset feed and all. Those decisions uh, also have to be uh, uh, based on this, uh, many of the things that come into play. Now uh, we are going into the aperture synthesis. This is just an introduction I will give. The actual thing I will cover it up in the um, final chapter. So this is just to give you a feel for it, what is aperture synthesis. So um, uh, I'll start reading from here. Instead of single, uh, instead of a single antenna, an antenna array aided with the rotation of Earth can synthesize a large antenna aperture. This overcomes the difficulty of constructing single large antenna. This technique was named by Martin Ryle as supersynthesis. Okay, it is possible to use the Earth's rotation. Mm, uh, for multiplexing your antennas. Multiplexing means, um, in, in a simple sense, uh, I, I will tell that um, you want um, uh, to observe a radio source, you know that its property does not change with time. For example, it may be following the Planck's law and keep on following and it will be radiating the same kind of radiation always. In such cases, Today you can uh, measure it from some angle, tomorrow you can measure it from some angle uh, and day after tomorrow you can measure it from some other place and over um, a period of time you can get acquire the data and construct an image from there. That is like having um, so many antennas at the same time. Since the signal does not change, you can do that one. Now. Um, <laughs> so, a radio uh, interferometer, you can do radio interferometry um, and you can construct a uh, image of whatever dimension you want, uh, I mean whatever resolution you want using only two, sim two antennas. <coughs> but the problem will be like time, how much time uh, and some of these things, but theoretically it is possible. To use. Only thing is that you have to have a facility of changing the distance between the antennas. Now also, one of these persons, Martin Ryle, who was uh, awarded Nobel Prize, the, this engineer actually uh, found out the technique for, uh, super, called the super synthesis. Uh, for this technique, he got the, he was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize for this. So uh, this man, he found that it is also possible to take the advantage of the earth rotation for placing the antennas at different places. Because the earth is rotating, so um, um, you can use that one to position the antenna at different place because the source is not on the earth, it is at a different place. So you can always use that one, our earth antenna you can always use that one and take the advantage of earth rotation. So this is, this is the basic background of uh, I mean, these are the basic objectives of uh, uh, aperture synthesis. We will study uh, three cases of uh, super synthesis uh, using an antenna array. These cases are based on observing a radio source towards the celestial north pole, observing a radio source along the celestial equator, observing a radio source along the celestial latitude of the array. So uh, all these three cases you can see now, and we are going to enter into a slightly complicated diagram. I mean, not now, uh, in later, later slides. So here you can see that this is the Earth. Um, we are on this place, this is our area, let us say, and we have uh, an antenna array. Uh, you, let us say it is in Y shape, and we have several antennas along this direction, along this direction, and along this direction, and the plane of this will be uh, located here. So if the earth rotates, this uh, plane will be rotating along with this one. The text says, consider a large number of antennas spread over a plane area at some latitude between 20 degrees and 70 degrees. Why I am telling this? Because um, I, if I am at, um, uh, we, I can be at this point or I can be at this point also. So the, this is a point which is between this and this. Somewhat like our GMRT 
uh, what are the latitude and longitude, you can see that it will be somewhat uh, near, closer to this. So these antennas uh, track a distant radio source located on the celestial north pole. Um, you know, due to the rotation of Earth, the entire array rotates as seen from the radio source. So your source of radio um, uh, source is along this direction, and you want to observe uh, using this antenna to this particular source. That is one of the cases. So here it is. Your source is here. All your antennas are focused towards the, um, the celestial north pole. And there is a special um, um, uh, case of uh, UVW coordinates that is called as U dash V dash W dash uh, coordinate. That is the special case of UVW coordinate where the source is exactly located on the celestial north pole. Now, <coughs> this particular uh, plate is your um, uh, array. And this particular plate is a plate parallel to the Earth's equator. This is your Earth equator, and it will be this plate will be rotating along with this plate. If you you are going very far away, so you can think that this has merged into this one because this distance is very high. So you can see that all your antennas are looking to the celestial source on this side, and they are looking through this this plate. You can see this is look, looking through this plate. So um, uh, on this plate, if you plot the uh, their time uh, pattern, you can see that on this plate, you will see that your antennas are moving like this, and this, and this. So that way you can see that you are populating this area, which is the U dash V dash plane, from which you are constructing the image. So this will happen, the more you observe, over 24 hours, you will get full circles for this. You will get full circles. Then after that, if you take uh, another rotation, you will again get a circle which will be overlapping this uh, uh, previous circle. So therefore, you have to move the antenna to some other position and again do it. That is what I was talking about. That you can, uh, if you have a uh, positioning ability with two antennas, you can actually fill this aperture area, this UV plane. So I just read it out. Let a rectangular coordinate system. Uh, U dash V dash W dash is the origin of the center of the uh, plane of antenna. Let the source be a celestial uh, at celestial north pole to which W dash axis points. Let U dash V dash plane be stationary to the source. Due to the rotation of Earth, the antennas will appear moving over U dash V dash plane. So the, you can see that this, this is what I say as seen from the source. The Loki A dash V dash and C dash of antennas A, B, and C on the UV plane will be circled over a period of 34 hours. We record uh, the output voltage of the antenna and place them on the UV plane. Yeah, this point I missed out. So, so at this point, uh, at, at any instant of time, the antenna will produce some output. So that output, um, you have to keep it as a data, which is a, a data of the electric field at this point and that way you fill up this entire plane. Now this entire plane, uh, if you put up with different data in this, this entire plane will act as a single antenna and for this, the beam pattern that you simulate from this will be much narrower as compared to each individual antenna's beam pattern. So this is what you do in super synthesis and using the rotation of Earth, you are doing it. It's a very simple case. We go to another extreme case. Mm, after this, here. <coughs> so now, in this case, what happens is, you are um, uh, you, you are inclined like this, but you are looking at something which is uh, on the celestial equator. So in this diagram, you can see that your source, instead of getting to uh, being here, you are looking at a source which is in this direction. So you will be rotating and looking and along this direction. So your, um, the, the, this, this is a plate perpendicular to the direction you see. So you will see that your, project, your antennas will be projected here on this and this forms the UV plane because W should be the axis along which the uh, source is. 
So now you see that the projection is here, and um, in this case, the projection will uh, form out uh, instead of um, a circular or elliptical kind of thing, it will be straight lines. So the 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 important part here is you are not uh, in 24 hours uh, you will be actually covering this along this direction and again coming back. So your another 24 hour observation will be complete waste. So here you cannot do that one. Another 12 hour observation will be complete waste. So you, uh, in other case, what was happening is that they were mapping uniquely on this each point in for a 24 hour duration. Here it is not so. For 12 hour it is unique. But uh, next 12 hour it is not. And also you want the UV plane to be in two dimensions because this will be the final aperture area of the synthetic antenna, synthesized antenna. Okay, I will then uh, start here. Uh, last time we went to some of the slides coming under this topic, this principle of aperture synthesis. I uh, will um, go through this slightly again. We are uh, trying to build the base for uh, the aperture synthesis uh, used in radio astronomy. Now, I will just uh, read this one for a recap. Instead of a single antenna, an antenna array aided with the rotation of arc can synthesize a large antenna aperture. This overcomes the difficulty of constructing single large antenna. This technique was named by Martin Ryle as supersynthesis. So here we shall uh, study three cases of supersynthesis. Observing the radio source towards the celestial north pole, observing a radio source along the celestial equator and observing it along a celestial latitude of uh, the antenna array between north and uh, uh, equator. So, before that, we I show you the geometry of this here. See, this is a antenna array consisting of uh, this, uh, you can see three arms are there, something like this. So these are the antennas, two dots are the antennas. And uh, on the earth, this is between uh, this is the rotational axis of the north, which will go to the celestial north pole and which will extend to the celestial uh, south pole. And this equator will, uh, you can extend it and it will become the celestial equator. This particular array is somewhere here. So this is between uh, north and the equator here. And uh, we will see what happens when we are observing a source along this direction, that is towards the celestial north pole, observing the source along this direction, that is uh, parallel to, uh, 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 along the equatorial plane in that direction, and so observing a radio source along somewhere between this, along this direction. Let us say. I will just read it here. Consider a large number of antennas spread over a plane area of some latitude between 20 degrees and 70 degrees. So this is the position. These antennas track a distant radio source located on the celestial north pole. Uh, due to the rotation of Earth, the entire antenna array rotates as seen from the radio. So what it says is, if you keep on tracking a source, the Earth will also have a rotation. So your antenna's uh, position will be changing. And uh, will be, and that that is what you see when you are observing a, a radio source. You will see you will be tracking the radio source. So the the direction of the antennas will be changing because you are tracking it, and also the position of the antennas will also change because the earth is rotating. So using both of these, we will try to uh, build a larger antenna. Not the just the array what we have here, but uh, these array can be multiplexed as um, different sources for diff uh, different antennas for different positions. That is, as the earth rotates, the position of the antennas with respect to the source changes, and so at every instant of time, you can think that think as there is a separate set of antennas observing it, 
and again after some time you think that there is another set of antennas observing it and so you construct a very large uh, um, antenna system and this is possible only for sources which do not change with time. I mean to say that the radio characteristics of this uh, source should not change with time. For example, a black body you can uh, by, uh, such as a star or something like that which continues to emit uh, in a particular band a type of signal which doesn't change which sigma or mu. I mean to say that uh, uh, the random nature of the signal whose mean and variance standard deviation etc do not change with time. Now we will go to the mapping. Now this particular plate we will fix it. This is parallel to the earth's uh, equator or the celestial equator. This will remain safe. And uh, if you consider the celestial equator then this point will be the point of, on which the earth, earth is here. And this is the uh, celestial uh, north pole. And this plate, uh, this plate, if you keep it fixed, the earth will be rotating like this. It will rotate, continue to rotate like this. And so, this is the plane in which the antennas are there. That is this one. This is this one. So, on this plate, uh, this plate will rotate with the earth. On this plate, you can see that there are several antennas that are this uh, Y shaped or something like that. Here I have not shown Y shaped. I have given uh, some three antennas here A, uh, B and C. This A, B and C are sitting on this plate. So as it, uh, as the earth rotates, we know that the source is at the uh, north uh, celestial, uh, uh, celestial north pole. So if you see the antennas, the projection of the antennas on this fixed plate the position of antenna A is A dash, B is B dash, C is C dash. So when this one rotates, this point will move on this, on this plate. So that is shown here. So you can see that the, uh, uh, the, the projection A dash is here. It will move like this. The projection B dash will move like this. And projection C dash will be moving like this. And also, you, uh, if you remember, the UV plane, UVW coordinate, you know that the W axis always points to the celestial, uh, always points to the source. So, a special case of UVW coordinates is U dash, V dash, W dash coordinates. That is when the source is at the celestial north pole, exactly on the celestial north pole. This is same as that, except that this is a special case where you consider that uh, source to be on the north pole. Now, uh, you can see it here. So, you know, on this UV plane, you can see that the location of the antennas are moving. Now, if we uh, take the data of uh, uh, the antennas, or uh, let us say the the uh, the power output from the antennas, and if we put at this point at time t1. At the time T2, we put it at this point. At time C, we put it at this point, and so on. Since the the characteristic of the source does not change, so you can see that after a long period of time, this entire area will be filled with set of data. So this is the this is what is done in synthesis, um, synthesizing um, earth rotational synthesis or super synthesis, whatever you call this one. So I will just read this one in case I miss something. Let a rectangular coordinate system u dash v dash w dash is the origin of center of plane of antenna. Let the source be at celestial north pole to which w dash axis point. Let u dash v dash plane be stationary to the source. Due to the rotation of r the antenna will appear moving along over u dash v dash plane as seen from the source. That is this explanation. This one. The antenna will be moving along with u dash v dash w dash. The Loki a dash v dash 
and C dash of the antennas A, B, and C on the E dash V dash plane will be circles of 24 hours. That means in 24 hours this will form a circle. And if you go to the next 24 hours, again it will just go over this one. So um, there is no point in observing a celestial, a, 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 an object at the celestial north pole for more than 24 hours unless you change the physical position of the antenna. That means you have to bring the antenna somewhere here, so you make another line here in another 24 hours. Or you have many antennas, so you will have many. Your idea is that you have to fill this uh, UV, U dash V dash plane, so that this entire thing forms the aperture of the synthesized, uh, synthesizing antenna. So that will form a new antenna. This data is spread along this, and with this data, you can analyze the shape of the source in two dimensions, or the intensity distribution of the source. So that is the idea. So therefore, in here, um, if some of you must be knowing about uh, VLA, where they have the ability to uh, move the antenna. So uh, the, uh, they move the antennas because they want to populate this uh, U dash V uh, dash plane or UV plane more. So they adjust the baseline. Baseline is uh, um, the distance between uh, any two antennas. That is a baseline form for uh, correlator uh, them formed by the two antennas. So if there is any question you can put because this may be slightly difficult to understand. Okay, so this is the case when we were observing at the uh, celestial north pole. Now we go to the other case. Now the second case is that we said that the uh, observation should be along this direction, that is uh, um, along the equatorial plane. So you can see that now your um, W should be pointing towards the source, so your UV plane becomes perpendicular to it and this plate is fixed here. And we want to see what will be the projection looking like as the arc rotates of these antennas. A, A, A dash, B, B dash, and C, C dash. As the, as the earth rotates, it will rotate in this direction. The, the source is much far away. It will remain, um, with respect to the source, uh, you can see that this plate we have fixed with respect to the source. We always fix this one with respect to the source. So, the projections, uh, we have to see how it appears on the UV plane. If we are able to populate the uh, UV plane in two dimensions, then we can form an image of the source. <coughs> how we form the image? That is by Van Sittard's Zernike uh, equation. That we will, I will explain it slightly uh, after this, slightly later. So in this case, you can see as the arc rotates, these antennas will um, form straight lines on this plane. So this is the UV uh, plane and uh, you can see in first 24 hours it will go, uh, first 12 hours it will go along this direction and next 12 hours it will come back in this direction. So, so here you can see that you have to observe this only for 12 hours because the next 12 hour observation will give you the same result. Or if you want to observe it more than that, so after 12 hours you have to change the position of the antenna. So you can form another line here, another line here, another line here and so on until this gets fully occupied. When you have sufficient data of this, then you can think that this is the aperture plane of the synthesized antenna and if you uh, relate this uh, with the source, you can get the source intensity distribution in the LN coordinate system. Now in case I miss uh, here something, uh, uh, I'll read this one. Here the Loki A dash, B dash and C dash of antennas A, B and C on the UV plane form straight lines. Thus, if all the antennas are posited on a single east-west line, then the Loki will fall on 
straight line. Hence, the population of UV plane will be one dimensional, which is not sufficient for making a radio image of solar transformation. Okay. If you have an antenna array, now uh, this uh, says that why you have a shape of, uh, like for example, GMRT has a Y shape uh, kind of thing. Mm. The uh, reason for keeping Y shape is that the 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 loci on this uh, UV plane, this one. If you keep it uh, in the east west, let us say we have only the east west uh, array, uh, we don't have the other arms. Then what it will do is it will form only a straight line around this. So you won't have a data along the um, one of these axes. Uh, maybe this is uh, uh, east coast uh, along the uh, US. Yeah. So, so you won't have a data along uh, this direction. So your UV plane will only be one dimensional. And from one dimensional you cannot map the source. You need a two dimensional um, UV plane to map a two dimensional um, source. So therefore, um, you have to have antennas in other direction. So you have to get a direction along this. This is for the source when it is on the celestial equator. For other places, for a latitude of JMRT, uh, uh, um, it it can be done uh, by any other source. Uh, uh, any other position of the source can be done using a east-west array for where we are standing actually, uh, GMRT. But it may not be true for um, other arrays where the array may be in the, uh, near the north uh, pole and uh, or just on the equator and east west array uh, can, can be a problematic uh, thing. So uh, we, we will see all the details in later slides. I will look at it. Um, I think I read this one. Hence, the population of UV plane will be one dimensional. It is therefore necessary to have some antennas separated on the north-south axis. So this explains that why we have a, a different uh, uh, positioning of the uh, antennas. So we should have some antennas uh, having a component along the north-south axis. Now, we go to a case which is in between the first two cases. And here again you can see this is our um, plane of uh, antennas. It rotates like this, whereas it is observing a source along this direction. This is between north and the celestial equator. So it is, uh, it is somewhere in this direction. The W coordinate as you can see is pointing to that. And uh, this is the V coordinate, this is the U coordinate. and Due to the rotation of this plate, we will see what the projection looks like on uh, this UV plane. So here you can see that it will form ellipses. So that, that is obvious because the first case we saw that they were circles when, when the source was along this direction. And along this direction, um, it was forming straight line. So a direction in between will be an ellipse. So this way you can remember this. It is easy to remember this one. Uh, this is the way you can remember it. So, uh, if a radio source under observation is located at a celestial latitude greater than 0 degree and less than 90 degree or within the range, within a range greater than minus 90 degree and 0 degree, that is for the south side, it is talking about the south side, each of the loci will be an ellipse, that is what it says. Now, uh, these are some of the things what we have to remember. For making a radio image, we need to do the following operation. Compute the spatial coherence function known as visibility from the values of cross correlation. Cross correlation we have discussed that is the, um, that is between the signals of uh, two antennas coming from the, uh, from a common source. Uh, cross correlated. This is represented by small r and autocorrelation is uh, the is formed by the same antenna by correlating with the same antenna thing that comes as that that is usually uh, represented by capital R. 
a tau g is the delay between the two antennas. That is the signal reaching uh, the other antenna, the web front that I explained much before. So you put some delay in that so as to adjust so that the same web front uh, uh, appears at the final end uh, while you are multiplying or uh, there they should be in phase. So this tau g is the delay. The visibility is nothing more than scale value of cross correlation. It is a function of UVW coordinate represented as G function of UVW. Place the visibility value on the UV frame. Apply the spatial Fourier transform. Okay. The visibility uh, as I have uh, shown in the previous diagram, the, uh, we, we want this UV plane to be populated and this should be populated with the visibility. That is the cross correlated term. This uh, data should be that. That is what it means. Place the visibility values on the UV plane and apply spatial Fourier transformation. Also, I forgot to tell you that if there are three antennas, then you know that the, there will be several correlation products. Between this, this, there will be one. Between this and this, there will be one. Between this and this, there will be one more. And so on. It comes as um, uh, combination of n CT, where n is a number of uh, antenna. So there, you see, from um, if there are more antennas, then it uh, increases more and more the visibility, and so you are populating the area becomes easier. In actual practice, there are much more details like calibration and RFI removal. So I, I have told you about very simple, uh, I mean, just the foundation that what is happening. But in actual practice, uh, you have to remove the RFI from the data. Those data showing RFI, uh, you cannot use them while producing a map of the astronomical source. So you have to remove it. This, all these things comes under image processing. And that will be uh, probably the one of the final chapters. Then these are performed before the Fourier transformation. Okay, first the data that comes from the telescope that is kept, that is actually cleaned up from this uh, unwanted artifacts or uh, radio frequency interference lines, and then a calibration is formed because the, there are several antennas. And uh, each antenna may be having a uh, gain or phase problem. That is, with respect, we have to consider one antenna as a reference antenna. All the antennas has to be calibrated with that antenna. And also there should be another calibration that what should be the power received from a known source. Known source means whose power is known. So with that you can find out what is the power that you receive from the from one of these antennas, and then all of them has to be normalized or calibrated with respect to that. So you don't get ups and downs in the data from various antennas, and also the phase calibration has to be done. So with respect to your position, you should receive the correct phase from your reference point. Now the image obtained from Fourier transformation is dirty image. Okay. Dirty image means the first round image if you just calibrate the data and take the Fourier uh, transform of that one. And what Fourier transform I, I will talk in the later places just to relate it with the NM coordinate. So you will get an image and which will consist of many of the things, many of the artifacts and all. So gradually you have to, uh, these artifacts uh, may look like something extra is there in the image, although it may not be in the, on the sky. So you have to clean it. So this process uh, is called uh, cleaning or whatever it is. Clean, there is a technique called clean. Uh, some algorithms are there and there are other techniques also. But clean is the most popular for uh, Sources having very uh, smaller angular resolution for that clean technique is better. And the other technique is uh, generally called the maximum entropy method. 
and uh, all of these uh, there are several variants there are mod modified variants of uh, clean and other things we will talk about them when we uh, go to the image processing technique now as i said the image formed from fourier transformation is dirty image which are further cleaned with different iterative procedure procedures until the acceptable quality is achieved now we go for understanding that this is slightly uh, difficult uh, i mean this is slightly complicated uh, and all you have to carefully listen and in case there is any kind of uh, uh, query just uh, put it today i will uh, try to give more explanation to if you do not understand anything just tell me that i will try to re explain it again now before going to this diagram i'll take this simple diagram you have a radio source somewhere in this direction and consider that consider a simplest interferometer interferometer consisting of two antennas these are the two antennas this separation between them expressed in terms of wavelength is d lambda that means if this distance is some d meter observed at a frequency new then you find the wavelength lambda of that and you divide this distance by that wavelength to get d lambda this is d lambda Now, as you see that the source can rise up and down depending on which your angle of the antenna has to be changed, and so that this um, W axis always points in this direction. So in this case, your UV plane will lie along this, and your W will be lying along this direction. The uh, quantitatively, this W looks like uh, uh, quanti uh, quantitatively, this is the magnitude of uh, W. some relation with uh, uh, cosine of uh, uh, sine cosine of the these angles see the form it's very easy now this one i have drawn it here in three dimensions so it is observing a source first let us see the source the source is here this is the celestial sphere this is the celestial sphere this is the celestial north pole and this is the celestial south pole and on the celestial sphere you think a radio source exists and the radio sphere source will have its intensity distribution that means the intensity uh, around different points on the radio source will be different that is indicated by this contour this is uh, just pseudo kind of thing so you have to keep it in mind and one of these antennas has to be the reference antenna so this is antenna 1 this is the reference antenna here with respect to this the other antenna has to be taken up now between these two antennas this is uh, in the vector form i have written it as this d lambda i have put it as here this is the one and your w is pointing to the source this w in this direction that is this w is pointing to the source your source has a distribution of uh, intensity as a function of l m coordinate this is uh, this is l coordinate this is n coordinate and in this direction there is n n coordinate which is not required here i have not shown here so the total of this is uh, the square of l square plus m square plus n square is always unity now if i consider this as the phase reference uh, position that is of the uh, we consider that the, the, from this we will plot uh, the, with this as the phase reference we will plot all the intensity distributions along um, uh, this you can think it that way so your antenna is uh, um, uh, this w is has to point towards the source reference position a phase reference position sometimes uh, so uh now uh, we have one more diagram which i showed before this one if you remember this uh, diagram we see that this is the reference antenna this is the x y z coordinate and in this coordinate 
you have all these are rectangular coordinates. In this, you have always the z is pointing towards the celestial north pole, and y is points towards the uh, towards the east. Okay, and x points in a direction in which your meridian of the local meridian of the reference antenna lies. This is this one, and you can see that x is pointed along this direction. And the baseline vector, that is this one, because this is the other antenna, so this is the baseline vector. You can say it as D lambda, and here it is D, uh, it's absolute, you can put it, set it to, by dividing it by uh, lambda. And if you uh, remember this uh, formula, that uh, this one you can geometrically expand in terms of x, y, and z as component and so that d will be equal to x square plus y square plus z square to the power of half and also using the hour angle and declination the hour angle between uh, this antenna that is the reference antenna and the other antenna of the interferometer that is uh, that is h here here and uh, this is your declination so, with this you can form, uh, you can get x, y, z from uh, h and d. From h and d you can calculate x, y, z here. This is just for recap. Okay. Now we come back to this one. I will just read this one now. Let the origin of the ln coordinate be at the phase reference position of the source. That is, the origin uh, is here, that is the LM coordinate origin is at the phase reference position of the source. Radio intensity distribution of the source on the celestial sphere is I L M, I function of LM, this is this one. Sky intensity brightness at frequency nu in direction S bar or a, uh, uh, this is along the direction S is I S bar. So, your um, antenna has a pattern which will also, uh, the antenna is not uh, looking at the same direction but it can also capture some power from the other direction also because the antenna beam width is finite, it is not, uh, it is not zero, so it will capture. So, um, looking at along this direction, you will get some power and so that power is I function of S bar. Now you can see that S naught is the phase reference position vector and uh, this is the some point uh, and this uh, uh, within this angle d omega, this is the solid angle d omega, you get this power I S. And you can see a vectorial addition of uh, this vector plus this vector will result in this vector. So this is, uh, this vector we call it as sigma bar and uh, A s bar is the effective aperture area of an antenna in same direction. So you have to calculate the effective aperture area of the antenna in various directions. So this is the, uh, in, in this direction. The signal power received over the bandwidth delta nu within a solid angular element d omega by each antenna is a into i into delta nu into delta omega. Now you remember that uh, Jansky uh, unit is uh, expressed in watts per meter square per hertz and brightness, uh, brightness if you see that we have expressed in terms of watts per meter square per hertz per steradian. The steradian plays a role here. So if you multiply that um, uh, with the antenna, uh, if this is the watts per meter square per hertz, this one, with intensity. And if you multiply with the antenna aperture area, which is in meter square, so that meter square will cancel out. Then again, you uh, multiply it with this bandwidth, so that per hertz will go away. And then, you multiply it with this solid angle d omega. So, 
first ceradian will also go away. So finally you will get in what? Okay. Now this is for one instant of time. Let us see, um, uh, there are other uh, complications of this one. This uh, um, people have to read on their own because even though I can, I am trying to explain it as much as possible, for people who are new it may be difficult. For people, experienced people, they know this. I don't have to, I have nothing to say about that. It's for beginners, if they want to know, they have to read some details there. Or uh, even this slide uh, may be for them. Now, actually this is the most dirtiest part of this one. Uh, in the entire lecture, uh, you will find that this is, this is a place where everybody seems to be getting bored. In other places, uh, you may not see this one. So, today we will cover this dirty part. Now, I will read this one. Hence, the correlated signal power dr per solid angle d omega is given by dr. Uh, this R is stands for the the cross correlation small r. So this is equal to the aperture area of A in that direction in direction uh, H bar along this into the intensity along uh, at this point over a bandwidth delta nu over this solid angle d omega into cosine of 2 pi nu tau g, where tau g is the delay between this and this angle, this time delay. If you integrate dr over the celestial sphere, now dr um, is for only for this small uh, region, if you want to calculate the entire thing, assuming that other sources are not present, if you integrate it over the, over this celestial sphere, you will find it for this whatever is there will be collected in this, the rest will be zero because we don't have sources for this particular case. Okay. So we integrate dr over the celestial sphere and get the correlator power r as r is equal to, you, you can see this one, I don't need to read this one. This, uh, here I will say that this is the dot product. So d lambda uh, should be shown here as a vector. And then vector uh, product of d lambda with s bar. This one along uh, uh, dotted with this vector. With respect to the phase reference position s naught, we can write s bar as s bar is equal to sigma bar plus s naught bar. So this is your s bar. S bar is represented as this vector plus this vector. That is what it is. Also, um, I, I, I forgot to mention that, see, if you integrate over the entire celestial sphere, your antenna will also not take the power from other directions because its beam width is limited. So, even though there may be other forces, let us say, it will, those power may come through side lobes and all, but if you consider the major beam, as the, um, as to be dominating, then the power coming from other directions will, will be negligibly small in the data. Now, we may re-express R in above terms and expand as, you are just uh, expanding this, these are all uh, mathematical expressions, uh, you are just doing it for your simplicity. This is the, huh? sigma bar, is this, this is a vector representing this much space, this is a space vector. See, this is your antenna position and uh, this is your phase reference position. So that distance you are representing by S naught bar. And this is the place at some distance from this where uh, you, uh, you want to make a uh, differential equation which will integrate. So that is the differential equation d omega, you want to calculate this. So d omega uh, is taken slightly away from this at a distance sigma bar and uh, you want to calculate the power here and once uh, calculate the uh, correlation here and if you know the correlation at this point then 
by integrating over the entire sphere, you get the correlation at the all other uh, total correlation product you get. So that is the idea. So the sigma is that um, distance here on the source. So uh, coming to uh, coming back to this, there is nothing uh, much. Uh, you can just uh, see that it consists of uh, two parts. One is the cosine, and another is the sine part. And each is multiplied by over this bandwidth because it is taken over the the power has to be uh, over the uh, bandwidth that the new. And uh, this d omega is the uh, this portion of the. So uh, here you have uh, integrated it. This is integrated over uh, over this entire sphere. So uh, this is some slightly simplified. Uh, I mean, a, a re-expressed here. So you can see the integration is still continuing here and uh, here. This is over the entire surface sphere. We have to integrate this. Let us see what the next slide says. Okay. Now uh, we uh, we uh, uh, let me tell you that visibility uh, is uh, related to coherence. And coherence is uh, again related to the cross correlation, or maybe auto correlation in some special case. So visibility um, is a complex number. It will consist of real and imaginary parts. So if you know, people who are working uh, operating the telescope, they must be knowing that visibility is saved in uh, real and imaginary both. Are required. So you can express this complex number either real plus j into imaginary part, or you can represent it in terms of magnitude and phase. So visibility is the magnitude of visibility into the exponent of the j phase. Phase is the phi v. So if you express, you can re-express it in terms of real and imaginary. So visibility is uh, related as this. Aperture area a dash into uh, this is the expression for visibility. Okay. Where a dash is not the same as uh, a here. It is related to one. Now the relation is here. A dash is equal to a divided by a naught. So you are actually normalizing your Aperture um, aperture area. That means um, if you have, if you for example here, if you see this one, this is the dish. Let us say your uh, maximum aperture will, area will be along this direction because this is perpendicular to the direction. But then, if you keep the dish fixed like this and you go here and you try to see the aperture area. Or if you send a signal, the power received by the dish will be less because the effective aperture area is less in this direction, and in this direction it should be ideally zero, and in the back side. So your aperture area is maximum in this direction, and it will be reduced on either side. Okay. Now you can further scale it as this aperture area in various directions divided by. The maximum aperture area in this direction. That is this expression. Where a naught is the maximum value, and surprisingly, this is this is same as the the pattern of the antenna. The antenna normalized pattern of the antenna is same as this one. So either you can um, express it as uh, a divided by a naught, or you can replace it by p n. Uh, P n is a normalized pattern. I, I, I will I will come to that when I talk about antennas in uh, next few lectures. So a dash is the normalized pattern, same as the normalized beam pattern. That is what it means. Uh, what I explained here is the normalized beam pattern is a pattern of the antenna, power pattern of the antenna. And uh, remember that this is power pattern because uh, aperture is related. Uh, uh, aperture area means uh, it will be related with power. Now you just um, do some uh, mathematics here. You just uh, separate the real and imaginary part, 
and uh, you get this expression and this expression. These are uh, real and imaginary parts. And thus, uh, the correlation R, R in terms of visibility becomes this. So, with the previous uh, expression, when you when you compare this with the previous expression of this, and then uh, you can find it out as R um, is equal to, this is the cross correlation, is equal to, this is proportional to the visibility. Uh, this is the, uh, this is important. This R is uh, proportional to uh, visibility and other, uh, and also, mm, this is the uh, maximum aperture area, delta nu, uh, bandwidth. But what is important here is R is proportional to this visibility. So I'll go to the next slide. Now here, uh, things are becoming dirty. Let me see what else are there. Okay, I think we will come to the end here in this slide. So relation between, I'll just read it. Relation between design vector D lambda, observing point UVW and LMR. Okay, these are simple expressions. As you uh, can see that, as I said that this W is equal to um, D lambda A dot SO. What we saw earlier that somewhere we had seen uh, that D is like that. So, this is D lambda dot SO. This is equal to your this this one, this position. You can see W is here, this one. Okay. This is just how they are related. Actually. In actual case, these things are actually inside the computer. So, nobody bothers about this hidden. But uh, to know, you should know what it is. But the computer does everything. You don't have to think about that. And for image analysis, uh, engineers have written excellent programs that there was a talk from Sanjay Bhatnagar uh, some two months, uh, one or two months back. So they have uh, written these programs for image processing. Now, uh, this is the relation between this um, infinitely small solid angle, D omega, with the L, uh, DL and DM of this LM coordinate and divided by 1 minus L square minus N square. As I said that L square plus M square plus N square is equal to unity. So this one uh, is coming there because L square plus M square has to be less than 1. And uh, D lambda dot S is also can be expressed as uh, u into l plus v into n plus w into n. n is the other coordinate of n n n. In case you have, uh, just to remind you that, and u v w, you know that um, uh, these are the things. This is w and this is u, this is v. And uh, the projection of this, uh, of this design vector along this and this, you will get u and v from this. Now, this expression as you can think that it looks slightly uh, complicated, but, uh, well, I have uh, written here the visibility in terms of U, V and W. Okay. So, you can see that this is equal to a double integral of um, this uh, normalized uh, aperture or the no normalized uh, uh, beam pattern of power pattern of the antenna and the intensity distribution divided by this particular um, function into exponent of, this is visible here, yeah, 2 pi, uh, this expression is actually, okay. So, if you remember the expression for a Fourier transform, you will see that there is a double integral and then exponent of uh, minus 2 pi j into uh, some two coordinates and then integrated over um, another two coordinates here. That is a Fourier uh, transform. But here what is happening is in two dimensional Fourier transform you have only mm, you have only two coordinates. Here you have three because n also is equal to you can express that one is equal to l square plus n square plus n square. So this should be actually n. So, w into n. So, u into l, u l plus v n and w n. This, this portion is the n. 
So, if, can you just, uh, can we simplify this one? And this equation is the Van Sittard Zadike uh, equation. I didn't uh, write it anywhere in this slide. Just remember this. Um, so, if your source width, this, this dimension, are smaller, much smaller, then you can actually neglect the, this term this W into this term. And so, whatever remains is uh, your, turns out to be a two-dimensional Fourier transform equation. So, you see here. For, for a small source, L M and M are small. So, uh, this term, you can see that 1 minus uh, is equal to 0 0.5 and this is much smaller than, this is the approximation I have taken. That means, this term I am comparing it with these two terms and we consider uh, this to be much smaller. And so, this, uh, this visibility expression instead of uh, three dimensions, u, v, w, u, v, w, we are removing w and we are also removing the n. So, it becomes approximately the visibility of uh, u, v. And so, here you can see that this is the, this expression simplified here. And uh, the visibility as a function of u and v is equal to the uh, Fourier transform of, uh, this is the Fourier transform equation, you can see in dl and dm. And from this you generate the inverse equation. Uh, inverse equation means uh, you want to generate this from this, the inverse Fourier transform and you get this. Actually, today, today whatever uh, image processing uh, software that are available, they follow this one. Now, people have thought about that uh, we are uh, removing the W coordinate and doing a great mistake because we are losing much information, uh, especially when we are, when the source is extended. And uh, if we use the W coordinate as well, then for extended sources, we can directly form an image. That was uh, some of the part of it which Sanjeevat Nagar was saying that day. You might be remembering it. So, um, but uh, as of uh, what we have like uh, apes uh, and then uh, in the intermediate stage it came apes plus plus before, uh, uh, what is that called, uh, there is a program in Python, Kasapai, uh, Kasapai, uh, yeah. So, um, before Kasapai, this uh, apes plus plus was there, but they changed over to Kasapai. Uh, so, in, in this software, so far as I know of today, that they use these two equations. So finally, uh, what you will get here is, um, from the visibility, you would like to get the intensity distribution. This is your objective, that if you have the visibility, then, uh, I have written it, uh, it should be actually the function of U and V, just like W, I have uh, just ignored this. So, um, your uh, idea is that you collect a set of visibilities and from those visibilities by processing the data, you get this final image. Image in this, this, this image distribution, this L and L. In that, what is the distribution? This contour to your image. And this, um, generally you have seen images, right, definition, distribution and all. Now, uh, this is slightly reasonable. The transformation of x, y, z to u, v, w. Just recall this one. This was, uh, this one. This diagram, the transformation of, uh, this in terms of this. So, uh, and also, this is the reverse one that you, uh, have this x lambda, y lambda, z lambda. Where x lambda is uh, um, x divided by lambda, and this, this is normalized by not normalized, uh, divided by lambda. So x lambda stands for that. This is the hour, and this is the declination. H is our declination. So you calculate the uh, UVW where x lambda. Uh, yeah, here I have given this one. Uh, let the phase reference position of the radius source under observation be h not delta naught. So in this case, what I wanted to show is that I told earlier that it will be an ellipse or a circle um, when you are projecting the antenna. 
on the UV plane. Yes, it will be. The projection of the antenna, the geometrically, uh, it will be looking as ellipse or circle. But the visibility will not be. The visibility will appear uh, something like this. This will be two parts of this uh, ellipse uh, which is broken up. And uh, this is the reason for this. So from this, we are we construct this uh, equation. Um, uh, we would like to have a equation like u square plus g square is equal to something square plus something square. But it is not happening there. From this, if you uh, form this equation relating this x and y with u and g, you will find this equation. That is u square plus uh, v minus this square is equal to x lambda square plus y lambda square. And this is the equation of an ellipse provided this doesn't break anywhere. Now what is happening is, if z lambda is, um, uh, if, if z lambda is 0, if you come back to this diagram, if this is, this component is 0, that means this antenna is sitting over here. Instead of sitting over here, if it is sitting over here, that is it is lying in the equatorial plane with the reference antenna. In that case only, you will form an equation u square plus v square is, is proportional to um, this one. Okay. That will be perfect, but it is not so. So, the ellipse split and you have a data uh, on the UV plane looking like these are the th these are some of the things which I will come in more details in later series. This is just for uh, a little bit of uh, understanding this time. So this is an ellipse in the UV plane. However, the ellipse splits into two if z lambda is not zero. That is, if a baseline component exists along the north south. So this is you can see that this is the celestial north pole and south pole. Z axis flies on this one. That is what it says. That there is a component. If if D had been, if this antenna had been here, then this Z would have been zero. So it would have not have any uh, components along this uh, north south. So now <coughs> the length of the uh, okay figure shows the locus for a baseline with a non-zero Z lambda for a radius source at delta north. Along U lies the major axis. It is just a description of this is the major axis and so on. So, however, the length of the minor axis uh, along V is reduced by the declination delta naught. So, of the phase reference position. So, uh, these uh, equations I have given how they this is, this is talking about what is this actually and what is this. So, uh, what is this length and what is this length in major and minor axis. In terms of in functions of uh, delta naught and x lambda square, is, that is what it says. So what is important here is you have to remember that if a z lambda component exists, then the visibilities will be splitting like this. They will not form a uh, ellipse over here, but they will just spread out. And uh, that z lambda component is this one. That depending on this, this uh, distance will be created between this. This actually there will be. Uh, between this and this, there will be price of this distance. See, this one. This one here. So, if you see the, <coughs> some of you um, um, have uh, seen this, uh, um, uh, how things look like on uh, UV plane about uh, 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 the data over the UV plane, how it uh, looks like. So, uh, you will see that they are not uh, evenly distributed. In some place they will be more, more dense and in some place they will be less. This is because of uh, the source you are observing at a, an angle, the angle of the source and also the structure of your array. Um, uh, this is a, uh, like GMRT you have a Y array or something like that. And also it may be uh, dependent on, uh, uh, yeah, the the size also depends on the uh, frequency uh, and and so on. There may be uh, many other things, well, geographical longitude, uh, latitude, uh, especially the latitude 
latitude we place a greater role in this. So the mapping of uh, this, uh, your uh, visibility on the UV plane will be a peculiar structure and, and that will also be a function of time. Now, I'll just read this one. Figure shows the case of a north-south baseline for the different phase reference point under observation for different values of delta naught. The, if the component of the baseline Z lambda is made zero, the two halves of the ellipse join together. This is what I said earlier, that if Z lambda, uh, lambda is made zero, then this ellipse will be combined. So here it says that, what is the value of delta naught? These different curves are for different values of delta naught. So if the delta naught uh, is uh, 90 degrees, that is uh, the source at the uh, celestial uh, north pole or celestial south pole, let us say, then this is what you get. This one. When it is 70 degrees, you get a line something like this, straight up like this, and something like that. For, for, for this situation. As the earth rotates, depending on delta naught, the local traces and ellipse on the UV plane, visibility values of each instant are placed on the locus. The ellipse at space, depending on d lambda, uh, depending on d lambda, where d lambda is equal to uh, this one, this equation, x uh, The UV plane can be densely filled using more interferometer to different d lambda and more observation time. Okay. So this is the this is the inference from this. You need to uh, populate the entire UV plane, so you need more number of interferometers with different baselines. Interferometers with same baseline will uh, will only just override uh, these things, provided they are on the same uh, latitude. So um, or or very close. So so you have to change the position of the antenna and you require more observation time. More, the, more observation will also fill the UV plane but uh, you have also to change the position of the antenna so that um, you don't get an overwritten, overwritten uh, placement of the data. Now, uh, now things will become much easier if you have understood that. See, this is an example. The right figure shows an example of filling the UV plane with visibility obtained from an array of antenna. So this is a, this is the aerial uh, I mean, you can say the top view of uh, a particular positioning of uh, VLA antenna. So VLA is a very large array in New Mexico. It consists of uh, 27 antennas and the antennas are placed on uh, range so you can uh, change their physically you can change their position. So this is almost like uh, 150 degree apart, they form a Y array, something like our geometry, and uh, with respect to the north axis, uh, north direction, the, this array is aligned, this north array is aligned at 5 degrees, and this from this you can make out the geometry. Now, with this array, and uh, you can actually uh, get this diagram. I, I don't know whether I have written how much time it has taken for this or if it is a snapshot. I think it is a snapshot of uh, a particular instant of time because uh, there are 24 antennas, so there will be many uh, products of visibility uh, products will be there because n c t this n into n minus 1 by 2 that is 1 cc and 27 is 27 minus 1 by 2 that many points will be there. So at any instant of time you will have this one. And that you particularly observing a force at the um, celestial north pole. Let us see. I'll read this one. The number of baselines is uh, so and so. If and only if they are non redundant. As I say, redundant means that if the baselines are same, if the antenna, there may be four antennas, two antennas forming one baseline and two antennas forming another baseline, and if their distance between them is kept same then they will just overwrite each other, provided their alignment is also along the same direction. So they will um, just, um, this is called redundancy. So if you have a large number of antennas, somewhere some antennas 
can form a redundant element which will not be used to be used. That also I will explain why that redundancy comes. So you have to carefully design an antenna array. So you have to take care that uh, you don't form redundant baselines. The left figure shows the UV uh, plane coverage of DNA at any instant of time obtained from a source at celestial north pole. So this is snapshot. So you can see the U and V. So from this 27 antenna, see how many points are produced from this one. So as the arc will rotate, these points will keep rotating in some direction. And so this, ent our, uh, this entire area will be densely populated with this. Uh, for GMRT also, you can uh, see that the, the, the instantaneous snapshot comes like this. In the you can uh, try in Ips or uh, in Kasaka, you will get. Now, uh, as I said earlier, um, the uh, same thing that uh, the, your goal is to make the radio image. The radio image is a map of intensity distribution. After observing for several hours with many antennas, the data on UV plane becomes adequate. By using this relationship, this one, this intensity as a function of visibility, integration, or um, uh, two dimensional scale function. Mm, uh, obtain the intensity distribution ILM. So from this equation you get ILM because you know these uh, things uh, you have got as data. This ILM is the radio image of the source. This is what it is. I, that you, you, when you plot this intensity distribution, you, that is the radio image of the source. That is what we are aiming for. Every uh, the radio number aim for that. However, before such operation, one has to calibrate data uh, so that it is free from various instrumental errors, any radio interference, and effect of scintillation must be nullified before transferring the event. I have not talked anything about scintillation. All these things I will take up later. You say effect of the atmosphere on uh, frequencies um, at meter wavelengths is very. Uh, so it produces uh, artifacts in the bit. So that is a very, 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 very small introduction to uh, uh, our definition of simulation. Okay. And uh, this is the uh, spiral galaxy M74. And um, this is from NRA. So this is a radio image. Simulation, we will come to that when we are going to that. Simulation, some portions are very difficult to, uh, it is, we will deal with that later. Simulation can kill your radio astronomer. You see, radio astronomers have many uh, enemies. Mm. Among that is the simulation, and other is we are uh, man made radio So, uh, this is another of this. A data taken from several distant correlator arrays of all over the world may be combined to increase the resolution of the image. This is known as very long spectrum is metric. DLBI. Okay. If you see our uh, if you see a radio array, you will see that it will be uh, having a stretch. Arms, arms means where antennas go uh, away from the center, like we have it uh, east, west, and south. Island. So uh, there you can see that they are extended to a long distance. Now, when you are making an image, the distance for a fixed wavelength, the distance between uh, two antennas, that is the baseline. Uh, if you if you go to higher frequencies, so I'm talking about d lambda, not d. D means uh, baseline length, and d lambda is uh, baseline length divided by uh, the frequency. So if you, if you increase uh, d lambda, you will get finer and finer frequency components in the data, and that will uh, finer frequency components means that the special frequency. I, I will describe what is special frequency later. Uh, 
not uh, not a time frequency. Spatial frequency is like uh, mm, within the space. If we go length spread over a space, you can think in that way. So not a true analogy, but somewhat like that. So if uh, you require large space for uh, one wavelength, then uh, you can say that uh, in, uh, the resolution is poor. Uh, whereas if you take very small space for accommodating one wavelength, you can say that resolution is higher. So that way you can uh, remember, but yeah, this is not the actual uh, definition or anything, but this is just uh, some way to uh, remember this. So that's, uh, uh, that's a little bit of uh, about uh, special frequency. So if you increase the frequency, observing frequency, not the special frequency, if you increase the observing frequency, or if you increase the distance between uh, the antenna, that is increasing the this time. What you will get is, you will get the finer portions in the image. You will get more details about the finer portions of the image. That is the, uh, uh, you, you might, uh, some people might have uh, used, uh, uh, while uh, doing image processing, uh, you have some filters on that where you apply blurring. Uh, blurring means you are actually uh, using a low pass filter on that. Uh, you know, so you are um, removing the finer details of that. The part you remove, that is related to higher frequency, higher frequency part of that uh, uh, image. So if you want very high uh, resolutions uh, and all, you need to have antennas very widely separated. And then physically, uh, it may not be possible to do that. So what uh, people have done is, they have used the data of different observatories taken at the same time for the same object and they integrated the data between them and formed the very long baselines. That is why it is called the uh, very long baseline interferometry. So this accuracy was dependent on the time or the, the clock they had chosen for calibrating or relating the data with one another. If you take, if you have an observatory somewhere, uh, let us say, somewhere in China or so. So, you cannot, uh, practically you cannot lay a fiber optic cable between China and India and, I mean, there are a lot of problems in that. Instead of doing that one, you can simply independently collect the data from both these observatories and you can um, uh, relate them and form the baseline for an antenna between India and China, for example. Hmm? Before this? Yeah, there, 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 there are many such observations. Yeah. So, I just uh, say, uh, read this one. The supernova SN uh, so-and-so with uh, galaxy so-and-so taken at 5 gigahertz. The left is the galaxy in the NG891 using DLA. So you see this one, this entire picture, and this has been blown out. A small portion of that has been expanded here, and this portion has been obtained by using DLA. So you see the, uh, this, uh, uh, this image was uh, not possible for uh, a single observatory to get, but uh, very long different uh, uh, base times uh, could uh, attain this. And with that, I come to the end of this uh, lecture. So, thank you very much. And in case you have anything, you can discuss.